Okay, in this video, I'd like to prove Einstein's formula for the specific heat capacity of a solid. Now, before I do that, I'd like to show you what was known at the time when Einstein was deriving this. This is called the law of Joulon and Petit. And what these guys found was that at sufficiently high temperatures, the specific heat capacity of almost every solid approached a value of 3 times R. Now, 3R, R is the molar gas constant. Okay, R is the molar gas constant. Now, just bear with me one moment and I get the formula for that. Okay, so uh, just let me just make, I suppose, a bit of an aside. Okay, so the ideal gas equation says that the pressure times the volume is equal to N times K times T, where you could think of K as the molecular gas constant, and you could also rewrite this as equal to PV is equal to small n times r times t, where you could think of r as the molar gas constant. Okay? And these two are related in that the molar gas constant is equal to Avogadro's number times the, uh, the, the, the molecular gas constant. Okay, so one mole has Avogadro's number of, mo of molecules, which is n sub a. Alright, so that's, that's, that's as much of an aside as I want to do. So anyway, that was, that's what was experimentally known at the time of Einstein, okay? The, the law of Joulong and Petit. However, when the temperature was not sufficiently high, you had curves looking something like this. Alright, and you had, we'll say that might, be, that might be a heavy solid, so you might have a low frequency. And for, um, for light solids, you might, have, you might have a curve looking like this. Now, if you're thinking about this, you might say, well, hold up a second. This implies that at, if I approach my temperature towards zero Kelvin, then my specific heat capacity is going to go to zero. And that's what this, that, that's absolutely what this implied. And what, what Einstein was able to, uh, he, he was able to predict was a thing called a Bose-Einstein condensate. Well, it wasn't just him, it was uh, an Indian called Bose as well, Einstein condensate. And what he basically said was that in and around zero Kelvin, well actually he did, I think he did say zero Kelvin, but in and around zero Kelvin that matter behaves completely differently than the way it does at, at normal temperatures and that um, you get these things called Bose-Einstein condensates. And I think the, this was done in about the 80s and we got almost a, a zero Kelvin. Now it's, it's the laws of thermodynamics do not allow us to go to zero Kelvin and the current laws of thermodynamics do not allow us to go to zero Kelvin. But anyway, Einstein predicted if you got low enough, your specific heat capacity would go to zero and that you'd have a new phase of matter. Anyway, so that's what, that's what was known. And the thing is, though, we didn't, have, we didn't have a mathematical formula for describing what happened when the temperature was not sufficiently high enough. So Einstein came along and he decided to use Max Planck's, uh, Max Planck's ideas of quantized energy levels. So just to very quickly remind you, Max Planck said that you couldn't have have any energy level, you could only have specific energy levels like on a stairs, okay? So like on a stairs, you can't be anywhere between steps, you, you can't stand between steps, you, you're either on a step or you're not. So it's similar, it's, you will say, Einstein said, we'll say at the ground, you might have a, a ground state energy, and everything is a multiple, well this might be one times, this might be two times, uh, why did I write D? Two times the, free, the, the energy, three times the energy, four times the energy, but you could not have anything in between that. The energy levels were quantized or came in packets. So Einstein made a couple of of um, he made a couple of su suggestions. Okay, so he made a couple of assumptions. So the first one was that he had uh, it had Avogadro's number of molecules. So he had one mole basically. Okay, so that's Avogadro's number, and each of these could vibrate independently. All right. He said then they could each vibrate in the three spatial dimensions. So they could vibrate in the x, the y, and the z. All right, which is a fair enough assumption. The next thing he assumed, and this is kind of this is a, a bit of a jump, he assumed that each of these vibrations could be analyzed using a linear harmonic oscillator, as a linear harmonic oscillator. Now, a harmonic oscillator is one of the most fundamental uh, pieces of classical physics, and often people try and they try and model real physical systems by linear harmonic oscillators. Now that's modeling, I, I, I've, I did a video in the past on models, but basically Einstein said we couldn't possibly know what 
uh, each of these vibrations actually does. So what we'll do is we'll assume that they behave as a linear harmonic oscillator. So that meant, of course, that for each mo molecule you had three ways of vibrating so that each molecule had three times three linear harmonic oscillators. So your mole or your Na atoms had three times N sub A linear harmonic oscillators. All right, that's how many linear harmonic oscillators there were per mole. And he also assumed that there was a characteristic frequency. And I'm not going to talk about a characteristic frequency, but that is a just, that's just another one of his assumptions. So the next thing we need to do is look at, uh, we need to look at Max Planck's formula for quantized energy levels, or the average energy level in a quantized system. So Max Planck said the following. He said that the average energy per unit frequency that's new. That's I think it's I think it's the, that's the Greek letter new or small new. Okay, you can put in F if you like. It's it's the same thing. Okay, I get rid of that square back. The average this the average energy is given by these angle brackets, and basically he said it's h times the frequency, which is an energy, divided by h times the frequency over the over kT. Both the kT being Boltzmann's constant. Okay, that's not that's not to do with the uh, uh, with the the molecular gas constant. Okay, this K is not the same as this K. Okay, this one is Boltzmann's constant. Anyway, so that's what he found. So as a result, we know, of course, that Einstein said you had three times Avogadro's number of linear harmonic oscillators. So that means the total energy in a system, the total energy in a system is equal to the number of harmonic oscillators, three times Na, times the average energy of each one of these harmonic oscillators, which was the following. Now the next thing we need to know is that we need to know what the formula for the specific key capacity is. Now I'm not going to derive this, you need to just accept it now or look it up yourself, but the specific, the specific key capacity is the derivative of the energy with respect to temperature. All right, Something that thermodynamics will give you, but I'm not going to talk about that now. Okay, so thermodynamics uh, will say predicts this formula here. So what we, what we need to do is we need to, we need to get the derivative of this total energy function with respect to temperature. So if we analyze this, we'll see the only function which is a function of temperature is this exponential value here. That means that this is, a, this is essentially a constant, and so is this, for this particular partial derivative. All right, so let's get to the partial derivative. So I'm going to write this in green. So we know that the specific capacity at constant volume, that's what C sub V means, is equal to del E del T. That's the partial derivative of the energy with respect to temperature. So we have our constants, which is 3 times Avogadro's number, times the Planck's constant and the, um, the frequency. And now what we need to do is get the derivative ddt of what's left here. So I'm just going to write, rewrite this very simply. It's just bring e to the h nu over kt minus 1. I'm going to bring that above the line. Okay? So that's just rewriting. Sorry, that's the derivative we need to get. All right, so that means the specific e capacity at constant volume is equal to the following. So we need to get a derivative of this, of course, we bring down the power, decrease the power by 1, and then get the derivative of the argument. So then we're going to get 3 times n sub a times Planck's constant times the frequency times negative 1 times e to the h nu over kt minus 1 to the minus 2 times d dt of the argument. And I can't write it in, but it's d dt of this thing here. That's just basic differentiation, something you should be well familiar with at this stage. All right, so that means we're going to have CV is equal to 3 times N sub A times H nu. I'm going to bring that negative sign out there. Times E to the H nu over KT minus 1 times. Now, if we want to get the derivative of this, okay, the derivative of this is going to be, well, it's a derivative of uh, this. This 1, of course, means nothing. So we're getting the derivative of an exponential. So the derivative of an exponential is the exponential times the derivative of its argument. So it's going to be times e to the h nu over kt times the ddt of h nu over kt. I'm just doing this differentiation very slowly. You probably uh, you you would probably do this a lot quicker if you're doing it yourself. All right. So I'm just going to write what that means. That's going to be equal to c sub v is equal to negative 3 times n sub a times e to the, the same exponent as normal 
divided by e to the exponent minus 1 to be squared times negative h nu times h nu divided by k times t to be squared. Now look, just be careful with this differentiation, okay? Notice you need to be very careful how you differentiate an exponential. So just keep this in mind. Note it if you want because I'm going to get rid of it now to clean my board. Alright. So if I rewrite that formula, it's going to be the following. You're going to have the specific heat capacity at constant volume is equal to negative. Uh, it's not going to be negative, excuse me, it's going to be positive 3 times n sub a times hf over the square root of k times t. This is all to be squared. Now this is just a, a bit of um, a sleight of hand. I want it in this particular format. So in order to have uh, to bring the k into the square, I had to get the square root of k. Alright, so that, that, that's just a bit of a sleight of hand. It's only because that's how Einstein writes the formula. It's not a, real, it's not a big deal at all. So times e to my normal exp exponent divided by e to my exponent minus 1 all to be squared. Alright, but we know of course, as I said this at the start, that the molar gas constant is equal to Avogadro's number times the molecular gas constant. Alright, so if we apply that, we get our final expression that c sub v, the specific heat capacity constant volume of a solid, is 3 times r times h times the frequency divided by k times t to be squared times e to the exponent divided by e to the exponent minus 1 all to be squared. And you might say to yourself, well, where did this, why do we, we had root k up here and now we have k? Well, that's because, look, the formula for the, for, um, for the molecular gas constant uh, or the molar gas constant R has a value for K as well. Alright, so yeah, that's all I've got to say about that in terms of its proof. Now just to show that this, this particular formula fits the law of Joulon and Petit, bear with me just one moment. I'm going to rewrite the law of Joulon, or the, the Einstein's formula for specific heat capacity. So he said C sub V is equal to 3R times H nu over K times T to be squared. Uh, times e to the normal exponent divided by e to the exponent minus 1 to be squared. Now, what happens What happens for h nu, the energy, or h, uh, um, Planck's constant times the frequency, is a lot less than k times t. Alright? And if you look at this, and I'll let you do this yourself, if you look at this very carefully, you'll see that e to the h nu over kt, so we're saying where this is a lot smaller than this, so essentially we're going to get a really small number here, okay? They're going to get a really small number here, and that approximates to 1 plus h nu over kt. Now why does it do that? Well, ask a, math a mathematician, okay? So, yeah, I'm not going to really talk about that, okay? That's just an approximation that's made. So that means the following, that c sub v, which is this formula up here, it becomes 3 times r, times h nu over kt to be squared times e to the naught divided by 1 plus h nu over kt minus 1. Alright, and if you rearrange that, I'll let you do the rearrangement yourself, you're going to find that this is equal to 3r. Okay, so at, at sufficiently high temperatures, the specific heat capacity approaches 3r, which, uh, which agrees with the law of Joulon and Petit, which is what was experimentally observed. And finally, what happens where the energy h nu is much greater than k times t? Well, in this case, e to the h nu over k times t is much greater than 1. And as a result, you're going to get that the specific heat capacity at constant volume is equal to 3 times r times h nu over k times t to be squared times e to the negative h nu over k times t. I brought that e to the h nu over k times t to the top. And you might say, well, wh why can I do this? What, what about the 1? And I'm going to show you something here. Just bear with me. If you have a large number, and you're divided by the large number, Minus, or plus 1 or minus 1, whatever, to be squared. Well, that's essentially the large number divided by the large number squared, which is the same thing as 1 over the large number, or the large number to the minus 1. 
And that's what I've done up here. All right. And the last thing we need to do is just apply a small bit of a limit on this. Okay. So as as t goes to zero, e over negative um, e over negative h nu. It's like no, h nu over kt approaches zero more quickly than h nu over kt squared. Okay, so this goes to zero, but so does this, and this one goes quicker. Therefore, c approaches zero as t goes to zero. All right. So that's all I've got to say about that. I hope that was reasonably straightforward. Thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends and subscribe to my channel.